Well, thank you all so much for being here. This is I'm very excited for this program uh, today because. Uh, are that I received an email from Dan Rosenthal, uh, who uh, who emailed me a couple of months ago, maybe, uh, to share, and he said you should know that uh, that Brooklyn Law School uh, has an alum, his father, uh, Robert Rosenthal, uh, who uh, is going to be featured as the one of the main characters uh, in this new. Uh, Apple TV uh, series uh, produced by Steven Spielberg and uh, Tom Hanks and little known uh, yes some yes. some uh, you know and uh, and uh, and that he's uh, a tremendous hero from World War II uh, and uh, and you might perhaps people would be interested at Brooklyn Law School and I looked up to learn more about uh, Robert Rosenthal and was. Uh, suitably blown away uh, and enormously proud that Brooklyn Law School has uh, such uh, an incredible uh, figure uh, connected with our history. And so was so grateful that Dan was willing to come and uh, and share the story with uh, with us. Uh, and uh, and also very uh, delighted that uh, Dan's family is able to join us as well. So his wife Paula uh, is with us and daughter Joanna, uh, son Sam, uh, and their niece Katie uh, are here. And so welcome to, uh, to Brooklyn Law School. Uh, so what I will do is, uh, uh, and if you have those pizza in the back, so please feel free at any time to uh, help yourself uh, to grab some pizza, including family members <laughs> are, are welcome as well. Uh, and uh, uh, and what I thought, what we thought we would do, just to sort of share the story in a very conversational way, uh, is just to sort of frame things by showing the trailer from the new series, which is now uh, uh, available on Apple TV, uh, and uh, just to sort of set the stage, and then we'll sort of dig in a bit more to the context. So, airmen from 40 American bomber groups bled and died in staggering numbers in air combat. One of these groups suffered so many casualties, it became known as the Bloody Hundred. The men and the women of the Air Force really paved the way for air superiority over Germany. People we served with sacrificed everything. They called us the Bloody Hundredth. Yeah, just a quickly give the, the briefest summation of, uh, uh, of his life, uh, but is the most remarkable story packed into one human being. Uh, he was born here in Brooklyn uh, and uh, from modest means uh, and growing up during the depression. And uh, uh, his father died while he was uh, in law school here at Brooklyn Law School. Uh, just as he was uh, about to graduate uh, in 1941, uh, just as uh, the war was uh, brewing in Europe. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then uh, he signed up uh, for service on December 8th, which was, of course, the day after Pearl Harbor. Uh, he went down and he was already practicing law then in Manhattan. He had just graduated the previous summer. Uh, but uh, was moved to volunteer uh, for the Army Air Corps before the Air Force existed. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then we became a pilot uh, in uh, the air war over Germany. Uh, and uh, at a time when, as we know, the, the, uh, the survival rate of uh, air crews uh, in the uh, flying over Europe was extremely low. Uh, and so flying uh, eight missions, as uh, as Dan shared with me, was sort of, you know, uh, an amazing feat uh, to make it eight missions. Uh, and uh, uh, Robert Rosenthal, uh, known as Rosie, uh, made it, uh, flew 52 missions, uh, uh, which is stunning uh, that he not flew 52 missions, shot down twice, uh, uh, Taken prisoner uh, of war. No, no. Oh, okay. Well, we'll correct that. 
correct me on that, uh, but, uh, but survived. And then came back to New York uh, and uh, practiced law briefly, but uh, in the immediate aftermath of the war, uh, was called again and uh, uh, volunteered to go back and was a prosecutor in Nuremberg. Uh, and, uh, uh, and he was uh, uh, so an incredible hero from World War II. Uh, uh, 16 decorations uh, uh, for his service, uh, a, uh, a member of the Jewish American Hall of Fame, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, for his incredible uh, heroism. So it's such an honor to have you and to be able to share his story uh, with our community. Uh, and uh, so just to start out. Uh, by by uh, the way, uh, you've uh, done a beautiful job in summarizing my father we can leave. <laughs> not, not a chance. Uh, so just, you know, before we get to, you know, him, all of his heroism, and uh, but you knew him first as a dad. Yes. Uh, how was he, what was it like to have him just as a dad before you knew that later on in life what a hero well, he was? Um, he was my best friend, a hero, a role model. Um, Somebody that uh, uh, we could easily share a laugh with, or a cry with, uh, ice cream with. Um, uh, I'll give you a for instance quickly that I shared with you. Um, he would uh, make us breakfast every day. And on the occasional days that he would make pancakes, we would challenge him to see how high up he could flip these pancakes. Well, he, he it got stuck up there. And so we used to roar and, and then watch him clean the ceiling. But uh, he, he was filled with life. He just wanted to engage with people. Uh, he also was one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And uh, I'll tell you about that uh, when he was growing up some of these things that he did, uh, which were remarkable. And perhaps most of you or some of you can relate to how he learned. So his uh, childhood growing up in Brooklyn it was uh, modest. Uh, uh, his uh, family yes. didn't have a lot of money. No, they didn't. Uh, he grew up on East 21st Street and Avenue S. Um, back then, Brooklyn, believe it or not, was mostly farmland. And so he actually rode a horse down Flatbush Avenue at one point. Uh, uh, Inadvisable today. In a, uh, I think so. <laughs> uh, he, uh, his, his mother's name was Rose. His father uh, was Sam. He worked for the city of New York in the health department. Uh, he had an older sister, Janet who, as my father often described her as, uh, at some point, becoming his younger sister, and used to uh, always be introduced in, like that. She did that for obvious reasons. Uh, but um, he then attended uh, James Madison High School um, and, and would sing the theme song relentlessly to us. I won't, I'll spare you that because I sing like my father in a very monotone way. Uh, he, Your father, uh, I know, take, took pride in being expelled from the Glee Club. He, yes, uh, he was in the Glee Club and uh, uh, loved to sing, as I said. Uh, in his house, they had a piano and often would uh, sing and and uh, his mother was a fabulous pianist, as well as uh, his sister. And uh, but um, they would all sing. But what happened was in this glee club, uh, the teacher said, "I hear something really a sour note here." And she would walk around, and as she would get closer to him, rather than singing, he would. <laughs> and so she would pass by. But eventually, he was found out by her, and kicked out. Uh, also, my father uh, at that time uh, began to learn the uh, saxophone. 
And during the summer or hot nights, he would have the windows open at the house and he would play and uh, the neighbors complained. So that went out the window too. He was a fabulous uh, athlete. He was captain of his football team, baseball team, uh, uh, then uh, considered himself a mediocre student. Uh, and yet he graduated at the top of his class with honors. Uh, then went on to Brooklyn College. And uh, again, considered himself a mediocre student, more interested in sports. Uh, but um, uh, again, graduated at the top of his class. But during school, he was challenged deeply by a course in constitutional law. Um, in college. In college. School, yeah. And, and uh, that piqued his, his interest uh, very much so. So he, at that time, decided that he was going to go to law school. And, uh, and you shared with me and, and your family has shared with me that Brooklyn Law School figured in your family life. I mean, that he would he took great pride in being uh, from Brooklyn Law School. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, th the qualities that he learned here, um, first off, he was an incredibly hard working guy, he didn't have a lot of money. So, um, you know, he just really was able to focus in on his studies. Studied at night. Well, he studied at night, worked, worked during the daytime because of the Great Depression. And uh, he worked as a soda jerk, uh, which gets back to his love of ice cream. Uh, uh, he worked in the cafeteria. He worked many odd jobs because they needed the money. Uh, he, because of his working during the day and going to school at night, he didn't have time to really take notes. So what he wound up doing was he developed this photographic memory of all of the case studies and all of the notes that he uh, was learning and memorized everything. Um, uh, remarkable. And then uh, when he had free time taking the subway to the law office while well, he was clerking, um, uh, he would take a dictionary with him and the words that he didn't know, he would write down and incorporate into his language from A to Z. Well, your, your dad was during this time, uh, both I suppose in college, but probably even in high school, I guess, and then college and then into law school throughout the thirties, uh, was, I know that he expressed, uh, you know, profound uh, alarm uh, at what was happening in Europe uh, at the time with the rise of anti-Semitism and uh, Adolf Hitler coming to power and uh, what was unfolding then. And that was loomed large uh, in his uh, psyche during those years. Absolutely. Um, he, uh, my father was a big history buff as well, which I'll get to a little later, but uh, what was going on over in Europe uh, with Kristallnacht uh, and the manhandling of Jews and and uh, the uh, just the uh, breaking of glass and uh, and and the incarceration of of Jews uh, uh, it was quite well written about and he was feeling quite frustrated that he couldn't do anything at that time. Uh, and so, uh, and then anti-Semitism was quite large in this country. Uh, the country was severely divided, didn't want to enter the war, the isolationism. And my father was feeling very, very frustrated by that. Um, uh, one of the quotes he said is, uh, I'm a Jew, but, that, but it wasn't just that. Hitler was a menace to decent people everywhere. I was also tremendously proud of the English um, that uh, was standing alone uh, uh, with, with uh, what Hitler was doing. Um, they stood alone against the Nazis during the Battle of Britain, 
and the Blitz. I read in the uh, papers avidly for war news and listened to Edward R. Morrow's live radio broadcast of the bombing of London. I couldn't wait to get there. So he described uh, as, uh, and by the way, you can, if you're interested, you can find uh, these interviews on YouTube uh, that he did and, and uh, talks that he gave through the years. And, uh, and it really is palpable, the frustration that he was feeling that he expressed at the time. Uh, and, uh, and then came Pearl Harbor. Uh, and the very next day, uh, your dad left law practice to uh, to enlist. Yes, uh, he felt greatly relieved uh, and free. A weight had lifted off of him. So he went down and uh, he enlisted and signed up for the Army Air Corps. Uh, as uh, the dean mentioned, uh, the Air Force wasn't uh, formalized until 47. Uh, so it was the Army Air Corps. And he was accepted to that. Uh, he didn't realize at that time you weren't supposed to ask for what you wanted uh, in the army, but uh, he got it. He was a well-trained lawyer. Uh, he was. <laughs> he knew how to negotiate. Uh, he went through uh, pilot training and eventually uh, uh, was held back um, and uh, was sent down to Fort Myers uh, because he... He asked for combat duty, or, or, or they asked him whether or not he would want combat duty or trainer. And he asked immediately for combat duty. So the Army immediately sent him down for more training down in Florida. And there he flew target planes for gunners to practice. And these, these uh, targets that were trailing behind the plane, these gunners would try to aim and invariably hit his tail of his plane. So as he he was flying intermittently eight hours a day, but on his off days, this is where he learned how to be become uh, one of the great pilots of the war. Uh, during his off days, uh, he and his fellow pilots learned how to dogfight, and they would uh, and those skills that he developed uh, later on during the war saved his life. He really became. Uh, a tremendous pilot. He knew how to manipulate and control a plane, no matter what it was, unlike the majority of pilots during the war. And he took those skills and put that into, uh, he realized that he could do those things in a B-17. So and he, then eventually he was assigned his group, his plane, and at that time, uh, uh, during the war, he, he was given a nickname. Everyone is given a nickname in the service. Rosenthal, Rosie. His mother's name was Rose. There was a popular uh, song back in those days called Rosie's Riveters to honor the factory women workers. So hence the name of his plane was Rosie's Riveters. So your, your dad flew... Uh... B-17s, and uh, and just to uh, appreciate like what a incredibly daunting uh, job this was uh, in the early years of the war, as he described. I saw him describing on YouTube uh, the uh, uh, the fighter planes that that the United States had were did not have the range to go all the way to Germany, so they could only protect the bombers for so long, and then the bombers were on their own. Yeah. Uh, uh, and as my father would say uh, during, during his first 25 missions, uh, we were escorted by our bombers to the, uh, to the edge of uh, Europe, to the coastline. And then we were uh, promptly escorted by the German fighter pilots to and from the target. Yeah. And, and worse still, uh, that flying a bomber, uh, as he described, you have to keep it absolutely level and steady uh, to, for the bombing. You can't maneuver. You can't evade. You just have to keep flying straight and steady yes. uh, as a uh, sitting duck for all of the fighting Well, planes. it was very important that they fly tight formations. And unfortunately, at the beginning, uh, they were a ragtag group and flew lousy formations, which 
put the entire group at, at jeopardy. And uh, I don't know how many of you have seen any of Masters of the Air, but it is uh, uh, in some of the episodes, it is drastically uh, real uh, what they encountered. Yeah. Uh, if I may, uh, the first mission my father flew, what, let me even back up a little further. He, uh, after he got his plane, he eventually made it over to England. Uh, where he felt that he was now in the center of uh, democracy, fighting against tyranny and and all of the oppression that was ongoing in, in Europe. Uh, he was sent to the base called um, the 100th Bomb Group, and that was in Dis, Thorpe Abbott's, and their nickname, uh, for better or for worse, uh, was the Bloody 100th for the severity. They didn't lose as, as big as some of the other groups, but when they lost, they lost extremely big. Uh, in a B-17, there are 10 crew members. There are 10 people on board a plane. Uh, 17 to 20 planes would be launched from Thorpe Abbott's. Uh, and and uh, uh, the horror stories that you'll see and witness within Masters of the Air really show what it was like in in this uh, series. Uh, um, so he made it over to, uh, to Thorpe Abbott's. Uh, but even before then, what I uh, want to also share with you is is that the during World War II, it was so bloody uh, up in the sky. You were flying five miles up in the air in open uh, windows, it wasn't uh, uh, like it is today where you're flying in, uh, uh, in the lap of luxury as it is. Uh, open windows, it was 50 to 60 below inside the plane. Um, uh, these guys would have to wear extremely heavy suits and they also had relatively new oxygen uh, that they were utilizing. And the pilot or co-pilot would call around every five minutes up in those conditions to check in whether or not the, the oxygen system was working. In addition to that, um, if your guns during battle weren't working and you had to uh, get these guns working, uh, these waste gunners, Sometimes they would have to take off their gloves and they'd have to hit the, the machines. Well, it was so cold, their hands would freeze to the metal and no one was there to help them. So they had to get their hands removed. Uh, those are just some of the instances. Uh, uh, another pilot, his name is John Luckadoo. You won't guess his nickname. Uh, uh, one occasion, uh, a bullet went right through the nose of the plane. Wind was blowing in ferociously, and his feet actually developed ice around the pedals of this plane. When he returned back to base, they had to chisel his feet out from there. And he was very lucky. He didn't lose any of his toes or anything, whereas a lot of guys lost limbs and other things uh, before, com uh, you know, during these missions. Um, the B-17, my father described it as a piece of sculpture. Um, and their development of love between the B-17 and the men had to occur. It was a natural occurrence because they relied on these machines to take them to and from the target. Um, so there was an immense love affair uh, for all of their machines. Uh, so with that, um, uh, his first mission was to Bremen. Um, you don't mind me saying No, please. That. Yeah. Um, uh, my father always said, if no one was hurt on his plane and the plane was shot up terribly, it was a milk run. No one injured, milk run. So his, during Bremen, his plane was shot up terribly and wasn't uh, flyable for quite some time. His second mission, uh, he was in uh, a plane called the Royal Flush. And 
it was that mission that he flew into Russia. It was one of the largest, uh, longest missions of World War II, uh, where they dropped supplies off. And when he got back to it was base- like nine hours, right? Yeah, it was nine hours. And they got back to base very late. And then the next day, they were woken up very early for the uh, mission to Munster. And uh, <laughs> that mission, there were more German fighters at, at, at any other point during the war. It was the most ferocious, ferocious uh, sorry, uh, battle, air battle of the entire war. Uh, and with that, maybe we should play the clip of, uh, if they can. Sure. Are you able to? Are you able to pull that clip up? Enemy fighting. 10 o'clock high, 2 o'clock high. Going, 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 Pilot the crew. Did anyone see any other ship from the hunters? Top turret to pilot. Negative. Left waist gunner to pilot. Negative. Ball turret to pilot. Negative. Nose negative. Tail to pilot. Negative. Right waist gunner negative. Bogies, five o'clock high. <laughs> Pilot the crew. Hold on, everybody. Here comes right at you. All guns ready. Port side. Set a point. Hold on, boys. Nice shot, Robert. Stay sharp, guys. They're not giving up yet. We're turning our tail. Six o'clock. Oh. Okay, hang on. Put these new on your back doorstep. Uh. 
I hope this gives you a little sense of what they uh, endured. Uh, originally for this mission, 17 planes from the 100th Bomb Group were put up in the air. Uh, four had to scrub because of mechanical issues. Uh, so 13 went into this. Uh, into this. Uh, as you can see, all 12 of his group's planes were knocked out of the air. Um, uh, and people on board a plane. Uh, if uh, if they were uh, if you were lucky enough to bail out of the plane um, and you landed, uh, and if you were captured by the civilians, they would lynch you, they would shoot you, they would spear you, they used knives on you to whittle you to death. Uh, you were lucky if you were picked up by the German soldiers and then taken to a POW camp. Uh, uh, let me just back up. I, I have to uh, point out, uh, my son and I had uh, visited uh, the making of Masters of the Air. We were uh, uh, able to go over to the sets over there it is uh, probably the largest uh, scale of making any type of miniseries and the most expensive. And when we were over there, we got to see everyone and meet everyone. We went into where uh, the special effects were done and they were asking us, uh, uh, did, did my father actually do those maneuvers. And as we were leaving, Sam turns back to them and says, yeah, one hell of a pilot. Um, <laughs> uh, we got a chance at that time to meet Nate Mann, who you've seen here, a uh, pretty good looking guy, I'd say. Um, uh, he, uh, he really captures the essence of who my dad was. And we got a chance to, uh, talk to him and hear what he is bringing to the table. And it was just wonderful. We recognized immediately what a, what a, what a, a caring, wonderful, decent human being, very similar to what my father was. And so he carried that essence into this project and throughout it. Uh, then uh, what would have tickled my father really pink is that Sam was offered a, a role in this as a top turret gunner. And uh, if you watch episode three, uh, you'll see this handsome young man. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, again, this would have really, uh, my father would have been so honored. And, and I have to tell you, the 100th Bomb Group is really honored by all of this as well, having that legacy in, in there. Uh, well, that's incredible. And, and I will just uh, pause briefly to acknowledge, you know, seeing the heroism of your father and sort of what uh, that was like, uh, to acknowledge that two of our faculty members here, are Professor Michael Gerber and Stacey Kaplow, uh, their fathers were also in the air war over Europe uh, and uh, pilots uh, in bombers. Uh, in so, uh, so you know, an amazing uh, connection. So tribute to them as well. Thank you for your service. Yeah. Uh, the. Uh, that means survive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the uh, so uh, amazingly, after seeing that you know the third mission uh, over Munster, uh, he flew nearly fifty more missions after that. Uh, just forty nine, yes. Uh, but um, uh, I just want you to imagine, upon him returning back to his base, the only one uh, cots and possessions taken out of barracks. My father was the only one left in his barrack where it was filled with guys. And uh, the psychological uh, elements that he had to deal with were absolutely horrific. And then uh, the powers that be, because his group was decimated, uh, sent him to a flat house for rest and relaxation. 
And at that time, you were supposed to fly 15 missions in order to go there. Uh, and my father felt terribly uh, embarrassed and unworthy that after his third mission, he was being sent there. But they sent him. And it really played havoc on his nerves. Survivor's guilt. And survivor's guilt. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so tell me about the, the two times he was shot down, but not taken prisoner. But how did, how did that happen? Uh, well, on one mission uh, to uh, Nuremberg, uh, his, his plane was hit terribly. There were... Uh, um, there was uh, his two of his engines were shot out again. Uh, the plane became unmanageable. Uh, so from there, he headed his plane towards uh, the French uh, uh, coast and, and where he felt that he would have the best chance of surviving in his crew. And he made it there, but he crash landed into an embankment in between trees. Uh, the officers were all injured. Uh, none of the enlisted men were. He was knocked out cold, severe lacerations to his face and mouth, uh, his leg. He was knocked out cold. He uh, thought he had heard French speaking uh, people, but really wasn't aware. But the French underground smuggled his entire crew back over. He didn't wake up until he was back in Oxford at the hospital. Uh, once he recovered, he resumed his duties uh, back uh, at the 100th. And, uh, and uh, on his last mission, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you people have been watching Masters of the Air. Well, uh, a little bit of a spoiler alert uh, on his 52nd mission, uh, which is in episode nine, that episode alone could be made into a feature film. And it is dramatic. It is, you'll, if you think you don't know how to cry, wait. Um, my father's plane was shot down. Uh, he was the lead uh, uh, commander flying uh, the element over Germany. Um, there were a thousand planes up in the air at that time, uh, a thousand bombers. Uh, it took hours for them to rendezvous and to head out with that type of plan, uh, many planes. It took hours for them to get over Berlin. They had complete and total air superiority at that time. However, the flat guns and the rockets that they were sending up were less, but still active. As my father was leading, a rocket came up and hit his plane. His plane burst into flames. Uh, they were dead on board. Uh, uh, he, had, he knew that Russia had uh, uh, taken over a good part of Berlin. So he headed his plane over at the over the Ord Mountain, uh, Ord River, rather, and then ordered all of his uh, people out, and they bailed out, and uh, and then he was able to relinquish control of the plane, but it went into a death spiral, and uh, the centrifugal force was huge, and he was still recovering from his broken arm, he wasn't fully healed, and managed to pull himself over dead bodies and out through the hatch. And uh, when he got outside of the hatch, he opened up his chute and uh, suddenly there was quiet. It wasn't that horrible noise of this B-17 that was no longer flyable. And he pulled open the chute and, and uh, he thought he was in heaven. And all of a sudden he hit hard and broke his arm again and had other injuries and knocked himself out a little bit, but recovered quickly and saw these three soldiers coming at him uh, and then recognized that they were wearing uh, the red star. And my father said, Amerikansky, Roosevelt, Stalin, Chir Churchill, Lucky Strike, Coca-Cola, <laughs> New York Yankees. Sorry about the Mets, they weren't there then. 
and, uh, and he was also a big Brooklyn Dodger fan. Uh, but uh, they recognized that he was American and dropped their arms and helped him and took him to a field hospital to get recovered, uh, enough of the medical recovery. Uh, it was a very long, arduous journey up to Moscow. Uh, um, and before I get to that, um, uh, 40 years after that mission, my father learned that uh, one of the pilots that was on board, when he jumped out through the bomb bay doors, sliced his leg open uh, through with some of the metal and uh, found out 40 years later that terribly upset him. This, uh, this incredible human being was taken to a German field hospital and without the benefit of uh, anesthesia, they gave him vodka, he had his leg amputated. Um, so eventually he made it back to Moscow where he learned that his mother was sent a telegram saying that uh, he was killed or missing in action, but killed. His uh, sister held on to that telegram dear, uh, for fear that it would have ruined his, mo uh, his mother. And when he got into uh, Moscow, he sent off a telegram saying, mom, I'm okay, I'm alive, I'm in Moscow recovering um and they got that and uh his sister uh obviously uh, was uh, anyway uh then he sent off another telegram to the 100th bomb group he said hold my spot i'm coming back so this is you know mind-boggling uh that where he volunteers for service, asks to be a bomber pilot, uh, goes you know straight to the you know most dangerous role, uh, and then continues flying all of these missions. And after that, uh, is wants to return to his unit and was actually uh, I understand coming back and at at the end of the war in Germany and Europe uh, was uh, preparing to ship back to go to the Pacific to fly in the Pacific. Yeah, uh, to keep flying. Uh, but but then of course the war uh, ended in uh, in the Pacific also. Well, that part of his war career ended, and then uh, he got back and returned back uh, home. Uh, uh, and by the way, when he he finished his uh, combat career down in uh, Florida, and there he got a convertible and was driving back up uh, to Brooklyn and. He was pulled over and he had no idea why he was pulled over. And this officer came over to him and said, do you know how slow you're driving here? And my father said, slow? I have no idea. He said, if you continue driving this slow, I'm going to give you a ticket. Now, my father didn't have a care in the world. He was in heaven. He didn't care how slow he was driving, and but continued on his way up here. And then eventually, uh, once he got back up here, he resumed his law career at this very prestigious law firm in Manhattan. And uh, at that time, uh, because he held on to his emotions so tightly during the war, uh, he began to lose focus. He began to unravel. Uh, he, he was working on very important law cases there. And it just, uh, it, they all seemed humdrum to him in comparison to with what he was just through. And then in the Herald Tribune, he saw, uh, uh, and he was following uh, the uh, Nuremberg War Tribunals and the showcases over there. And then he saw in the Herald Tribune that they were looking for assistant prosecuting attorneys to uh, follow up on the not show, so-called show trials. So he immediately um, uh, signed up for it, was sent down to the Brooklyn Navy Yards, waiting uh, deployment, and nothing sailed on time. The, but the gangplank was pulled up. This to sail back to Germany, to it, go to Nuremberg. To sail back to Germany to uh, be a pro assistant prosecutor attorney at the Nuremberg War Tribunals. And uh, there was a cargo net. Uh, 
that hadn't been hoisted up yet. And this woman in a Jeep comes driving down, and uh, my father described her as the most beautiful woman that he ever seen. Well, she threw all of her belongings up onto this cargo netting, sat on top of it, it was hoisted up and in. That was my mom. <laughs> She also was an assistant prosecuting attorney in the Nuremberg War Tribunals. They met, they fell in love on board the, the ship. Uh, my father used to tease her. I wasn't sure if I was seasick or if I was in love, so I gave her the benefit of the doubt. And 10 days later, they were married. 10 days later? 10 days. Well, it took a little longer, but uh, that's, that's the story, and we'll stick to it, and I'll stick to that, too. Uh, and uh, and they were uh, married, I remember you telling me, in Nuremberg. Is in that... Nuremberg, the first American Jews uh, to be married. And they were married by the uh, mayor of Nuremberg. Now, my mother spoke several languages. My father spoke Brooklynese. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and during the ceremony, during the service, when it came time, do you take this lawfully uh, woman to be your wife? It was done in German. My father wasn't going to respond to anything that he didn't understand, especially from a German. He is a lawyer. <laughs> so he stood there quietly, and the mayor repeated it. And my father again stood quiet. And then he repeated it again. And the best man said, Yavol. And the mayor became very confused, Yavol. And then my father realized, oh, yes, Yavol. And, and then they went on with it, and uh, they honeymooned on top of Eagle's Nest, my mother, uh, which is where Hitler uh, did a lot of his planning uh, up in Birkenstock. And uh, my mother wore Lebenhosen, and she did a jig up on, on top of where Hitler and his henchmen once stood in making their plans. Um, and, and so I know we're, uh, I wanna hopefully leave just a, a time for a few questions. Uh, and, uh, and so just in sort of this amazing, uh, impossible to imagine sort of story, because your father, uh, you know, as he expressed his deep frustration at seeing, witnessing what was happening with this rising anti-Semitism and fascism uh, in Europe. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, there he is, uh, you know, seeing it through and now uh, coming back as a prosecutor yeah. uh, to prosecute uh, the leaders of uh, uh, the Nazi uh, uh, atrocities, uh, and including uh, personally prosecuting and uh, examining, interrogating uh, Hermann Goering, who Göring, Keitel, Yodel, the three main remaining surviving heads of the of the Nazi Party. Um, and uh, they were all, uh, Goring was just obstinate to say the least. And uh, Goring, who, who was the founder of the Gestapo. Well, and also and, of the Air Force. And of the Air Force. Oh. And, uh, and uh, I don't want you to, my father asked the security guard if he could have five minutes alone with him, and they refused for obvious reasons. Uh, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, my father was really preparing cases uh, for or against were the Wehrmacht uh, officers, the Nazi functionaries, and the German industrials that worked for the party. Um, these these cases were to be brought before the U.S. Uh, military tribunals. Um, my mother investigated I.G. Farben, the Nazi-controlled chemical uh, conglomerate that had used concentration uh, slave labor camp from nearby Auschwitz, uh, and the experiments done by Dr. Joseph uh, Mengele. Uh, one of the experiments that uh, the Germans were great uh, note takers. As a matter of fact, they had triplicates of everything including the experiments. And one of the experiments that my mother used to lecture on was uh, how much cement a uterus could hold on a living uh, subject before it would burst. 
Uh, these are the type of people that uh, uh, they needed to prosecute had to be documented. The, uh, the Nuremberg War Tribunals, uh, the war crimes, was the first time in history, as you know, uh, to hold people accountable for their war crimes. It was morally incorrect for you as a soldier to obey an officer, an order, for crimes against humanity. And you can follow those effects all the way through uh, Vietnam and further. And so, uh, uh, so one last question before opening up uh, to uh, to others. But uh, you know, you, you hear all the time about uh, uh, people who've had the experience of really both your parents uh, having been involved in this trauma and uh, who are reticent to talk about it, to share it. Uh, did they share their experiences with you and your sister, or and did they speak publicly about it, or when did you come to know? Uh, my my parents used to lecture, and I'm sorry they didn't lecture here about it, but they lectured at various law schools and would bring along a, a concentration camp survivor for um, really impactful uh, discussions on this. And it wasn't really until my teenage years that I really began to understand fully uh, the course of uh, my father's volunteerism to this country and, uh, and the great love of law that he had uh, throughout his life. Well, we are incredibly proud of his uh, service and his Brooklyn Law School uh, connections. Uh, and I will uh, open it up. I know we're near the end of our time, but want to open it up in case uh, there are any questions from uh, anyone here. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Eric Buck from class of 1987. First of all, oh, first question I have to ask is uh, Did your father have Joe Cray as a, as a professor? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you know, Joe Crayer was here like a hundred years and caught everybody. Um, but second of all, uh, I, I love the series and I, and ha I know it's 99% accurate. Um, you said your father couldn't carry a tune, but the series shows him humming Artie Shaw tunes to calm the nerves of his crewmen who were devastated when they looked around and realized that 120 men were gone and they were the only ones left. So is that accurate? And if so, did he hum out of tune or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, um, whether or not he hummed or not, he had the full command and respect of his, of his fellow uh, um, uh, people on board his crew and others. Uh, his, they wanted to incorporate his great love of jazz. Um, when uh, he was in the city, he would go to these jazz clubs with his best friend and invariably sit there uh, overnight. I mean, uh, all night long, sir, uh, sipping on one beer uh, and listening to the greats of Artie Shaw, Jack. Uh, you, know, uh, you, you make the list. He heard them. Um, so, so, uh, they, they wanted to really incorporate that into the storytelling. Great. I, I, I just want to say thank you. Despite the spoilers, I had a, <laughs> uh, well, um, sorry for the spoiler. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, I, the one quick thing I did want to say is I, I, I just would like to thank Apple TV, to Don Miller for writing Masters of the Air, a tremendous uh, book, to Steven Spielberg, Tom Hanks for investing so heavily across their brilliant careers uh, in stories of war and the men who fought them. There aren't enough words to express my gratitude to the production team behind Masters of the Air. I've witnessed firsthand the, for the past 11 years, Masters of the Air, um, uh, their love and devotion uh, they have poured into this project. To Gary Goatsman and Kurt Sadowski, uh, Gary Goatsman is Tom Hanks' business partner. 
uh, whose boundless knowledge and tireless dedication was evident from day one, to John Orloff, the head screenwriter, to his master story, he's a master storyteller who maintained the integrity of the source material and breathed breathtaking power into the page. Everyone involved has exceeded all expectation. As a viewer, you will feel their love and admiration for these airmen in every frame. It is authentic, it's heartfelt, it's history. May it resonate with audiences of all ages for generations to come in order that their legacy of these heroes be preserved. So thank you oh, for no. allowing me here. No. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank all of your family uh, for sharing this inspiration with us. We're incredibly proud of your dad, and thank you for sharing his story. Thank you. Oh, and before I go, um, uh, Dean, we want this from the 100th Bomb Group and from my family for you to have this. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, as you had mentioned before, my dad was uh, inducted in 2007 into the Jewish American Hall of Fame. This is his medallion. Oh, my word. He was inducted into it. Uh, in 2015, uh, a statue is, uh, is being currently uh, built. And in 2015, on the 80th anniversary of Victory in Europe, uh, there are going to be four people featured in this bronze uh, statue of Doolittle, two very famous fighter pilots, and of my dad that will be placed on the beaches of Normandy. Um, in addition to that, what? 2025. I apologize. I'm here and always gladly correct. <laughs> um, in addition to that, I want oh, you to oh. have this picture of my dad and then the below picture is of my dad actually returning oh, wow uh back to his base on his 25th mission wow and uh Unbelievable. And then one other picture of my oh, dad so uh I, these are fantastic so and, thank you and uh and thank you this is uh on behalf of brooklyn law school we thank you for this i, I admire this on the on the internet as well. This is really, uh, 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 we're incredibly proud of him and incredibly grateful to you for sharing this. And thank you so much. For, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much.